It's good to see you all today. It's good to be back in the beginning of the fall season and getting into our fall habits. And since this is Grandparents Day, I'll tell you one quick story. Learn something from my granddad. A little bit about something about staying calm in the face of chaos. We were out celebrating the 4th of July in the backyard with the little fireworks you could get back in the day, some of which you can't get anymore, like the ones that would spin and go up in the air and land on the roof and cause fires. They don't do that anymore. They didn't say that's what they did, but that's what they did. But we had a, a comb, you know, you light the top of a fountain and it would spray up in the air. And it, was, it was lovely, it was fairly safe. But uh, this one didn't work right. This one blew out the bottom instead of the top and flopped over on its side and started spinning around in circles. And all the kids screamed and ran in different directions. Well, my grandfather was sitting on the porch near this thing, and he just sat there and uh, <laughs> he laughed in the face of danger. And we, we learned a lot that day. We learned a little bit about being calm when others panic all around you. And uh, viewing fear proportionally, I think, is something else we took from that. So uh, thanks to all the grandparents and all that they have taught us one way or another. And that dovetails right into what we're talking about today because watching and listening prove to be very important things. Observing the world around you. For instance, parents and grandparents can learn a lot by watching their children or grandchildren. Have you ever watched a little kid exploring the world around them? Have you ever followed them while they do it? One minute they're going down the sidewalk and all of a sudden they squat down in that way you can't anymore. And they study ants in absolute fascination for a few minutes. Then they run off to that bridge, that little decorative bridge that goes over the stream, and they grab sticks and they throw them in one side, and they run over the top of the bridge and look at the other side, see when they'll come out, how long it takes. It's a way of learning, and it's fun, and it's fascinating. And that particular one, if you've read Winnie the Pooh, was called Pooh Sticks there. And it's quite a little game. And then scientists have found that they can learn things they never knew by just what they choose to watch. And nobody ever thought to watch this before and ask themselves whether or not squirrels were taking cues from the birds around them about whether things were safe or not. But apparently they do. And they discovered this when they got curious about what squirrels were doing, they were watching them, they took a recording of a hawk, which hawks happen to think squirrels are mighty tasty, nice appetizers. And they played the screech of the hawk. And once they played that, if they followed that by absolutely nothing, the squirrels got really nervous. And they'd look up in the air, or they'd freeze on the ground, they didn't go about squirrely business, because if they didn't hear birds chattering, they figured something's wrong, that that hawk might still be in the area, and that's why all the birds are being quiet, so they'd better be still. But if they played the hawk sound and they followed it immediately with happy bird chatter, then the squirrels just went about their business, because it sounded like it was safe. So you can learn a lot by watching the world. You learn a lot by watching nature. You learn a lot by watching those little kids who are pros when it comes to watching nature. The prophets like to observe the world around them as well. They responded to ordinary sights and sounds, and they saw these things as signs of God at work in the world. I'm not sure what to make of that one, but we pray that whoever it's for is going to do all right. Amos was particularly inspired by a basket of fruit. He and uh, Joel were both inspired by a locust plague. Now Isaiah was inspired by the priests chanting in the temple, so you can tell where Isaiah spent a lot of time. And Jeremiah was particularly inspired by a pot of boiling water and by that trip to the potter's shed watching a potter at work, as we had in this scripture today. 
God calls Jeremiah out of his routine. Now, this is an important thing. If you ever feel that God calls you out of your routine, it's best to go. And go see what God has in store. He says, now I'm taking you away from your scripture reading today. I'm taking you away from your theological arguments with other scholars, with those meetings with scholars you intended to have. I'm taking you away from the temple services today. I'm taking you out of your routine. Jeremiah, I'm taking you out of your head for a little while, and I'm telling you to go down into another world, a place you're unfamiliar with. Head on down to the potter's shed, and I just want you to watch what the potter does for a while. I'll get in touch after you have. So, Jeremiah goes. And imagine going into this unfamiliar situation, a place that you don't normally go, filled with sounds and smells and sights that are unfamiliar to you. It even feels different down in the potter shed, a combination of that clay and the water and the hot kiln over on one side of the place. You got those contrasts, you got the smell of the clay, and you got all those pots in there that have been finished. Some of them are glazed, some of them aren't, some of them are for ordinary work and others are decorative. It's a lot to look at, it's a lot to take in, and that's where God sends Jeremiah. Observe. And eventually I'll come and speak with you. So Jeremiah must have been wondering why he'd been taken down to the potter's shed, why he's watching the potter's work. And his concern begins to mount as he watches the way that the potter interacts with that clay that he's got there. Because uh, he's picking it up and throwing it down and pounding on it. What does this mean for me, for the people of Israel? What can possibly I take from this? He observes the potter just pounding that clay and then putting that pounded clay onto the wheel. He sees him carefully balance the clay on the wheel itself, slowly begin to spin it and raise a mass into a shape, into the form of some vessel that he has in mind. And it gets partway built. He's using hand pressure just so. He's applying water every now and then to keep things flexible and moving and the pot's coming along and all of a sudden it slumps. It just goes out of shape. It falls apart on one side. And so the potter shakes his head and says, that won't do. And he takes it and he just clumps it all back together into one lump so he can start again. And it rises the second time. And this time it looks right to the potter and he sets that finished pot aside, ready for the kiln. Much happier with that second time around. And so Jeremiah begins to wonder, now what is the message for me and for my people from this? Is this the story of redemption for Israel that uh, we're, we're like the second attempt where the pot comes out right? Or is this a story of harsh judgment for my people where the first attempt gets flattened back into an indistinct mass when it won't do what it should? Or even worse, was Israel and Jeremiah in for a good old-fashioned pounding? What's going on here? And what about us? How does this apply to us as well? I imagine it may have suddenly felt a little warmer and a little closer there in the potter's shed waiting for God's word. After watching the potter and reflecting for a while, God speaks to Jeremiah and he speaks of Israel as clay and God as the potter. Israel is in God's hands and so are we. God points that, uh, out that God can do as the potter has done. If the clay won't shape itself properly, it can be collapsed or if it won't Go under the potter's hands and guidance into a proper form, it can be collapsed back down for another go around. God says that uh, you should think beyond just your own people. I can do this with nations, a variety of nations too. And it leaves us to think beyond Israel and beyond what God can do with the nation and thinks what God can do with churches, what God can do with us. 
leaves it open to interpretation here what God is actually getting at in this particular moment leaves the potter to wonder if God is going to discard poor clay, difficult clay, clay resistance to the potter's purpose. God can build up or tear down at will, as God said. And we're given to see the full range of God's choices in the potter's work. This is not a comforting message, and it's not intended to be. The prophets often delivered hard messages intent on unsettling people, intent on getting them to reflect on the way they're actually living their lives and what God might want instead. It's to make you think God creates disasters for the nation that's intent on evil, God says. And we could leave this story right there. And it's been done in the past. Leave it as a story of judgment and warning. Dark and terrifying. Leave us all shaken with the warning. What will we do next? What will we do with this information? But prophets, real prophets, they don't do that. They don't leave you there in that awful place. They always provide some hope for the hearers. That's what real prophets do. Yes, the nation of Israel was intent on evil ways and God could destroy it. And the same goes for us, but that's not the end of the story. Jeremiah notices that the potter's clay was very carefully prepared. There were things that had to be done. You washed it repeatedly to get the impurities out of it, the grit and the sand and the dirt and the bug shells and the ocean shells. You wash all that away. And you do it over and over again until that clay becomes really smooth. The more you do it, the smoother it gets. Until it's ready then for the next step. You've washed it clean. And then the clay is pounded. It is lifted up. It's thrown down. It's beaten over and over again. Wetting it to keep it pliable, balancing it correctly on the wheel once it has been through all of these steps. All this happens before you ever go about making a pot. There's a lot of time and effort invested in that clay, a lot of sweat and stamina. The potter will not want to discard that clay after all that effort. And frankly, God will not want to discard us either. God is, loves us desperately. God's put a lot of work into us. And God wants us to live well. God longs for the children of Israel. God longs for all God's children. And wants us to listen to God's voice. To turn away from evil and from harm. Just as grandparents and parents let their children learn through interacting with the world and playing and pray at the same time that they won't be seriously harmed in the process and they won't stray too far from home. The potter works and reworks the clay until an appropriate vessel takes shape, something useful and beautiful under the potter's powerful, skilled, well-trained and patient hands. This is power tempered with patience. And in God's case, tempered with love. When we look at the clay, we see ourselves. It changes shape when it's wet before it's been fired. It's flexible. It's not fixed. It can change. It can withstand a great deal of abuse and come through beautifully. We think about the events of our lives like the washing and the pounding that the clay has endured. But why does the potter put the clay through all of this? And the potter and God are one in this story. Well, they're for a reason. All of that improved the clay. It allows it to be smooth. It allows it to take shape under the potter's insistent hands, loving hands, 
to become a useful form, but the pounding has a special purpose. There's something unique about that. It is done to remove air pockets from the clay. Get them all out, and you have to pound it over and over again to get all the air out of the clay. Because if you don't, when you put that pot with a pocket of air in it into the raging hot kiln to heat, the air expands rapidly, and you have created yourself a clay bomb. And it blows up, and it not only destroys that pot, but every other pot that you've got in there that you're trying to heat, that you're trying to turn into a finished pot destroys them all. They all become unusable. So, the repeated pounding protects the clay from the heat to come. Life's rougher moments protect us and strengthen us for the future trials to come, allowing us to bear up under the heat and not explode. Redemption is here for the nations, for the churches who turn towards God and God turns towards them. The future is, in a sense, in our hands. We are given control over that. Destruction that seems inevitable passes. As long as we're open to the change God insists upon for our own good, we are still like the wet and moldable clay, able to take on new forms. But when we refuse, when we say, what's the use? I won't follow where you lead. I no longer care to do that. I will embrace sin and death instead of God and life. But when you do that, you become like brittle fire and clay, easily shattered under pressure. How God feels about all this is encapsulated well and about us in a story about a physician and his son, a very well-known, skilled physician. And his son starts hanging out with a snake oil salesman. You know, those with the false patent medicines that cure everything and are mostly booze. Well, this guy is Father John, and he's got Father John's tonic, and his son falls in with him. It's really painful for the physician to hear his son call this fraud Father John. It really hurts him and makes him angry as a parent. But later, his son falls truly ill, and he comes home to his father for a cure which the father gives him, and then he asks his son, why, he, why is it when you're only sick that you come to me, and at other times when you're well, you call that fraud over there, father. That's how God feels when we succumb to idol worship, when we turn to evil in the good times, when we decide we don't need God, we don't need the church, we don't need each other. We can go it alone, God is that frustrated. When we only come home to God in crisis, it's wounded. But we can remember that we are in the potter's loving hands as well. We shouldn't fear the changes that will come. And we should accept God's will and go in God's way. And on the way, we can be assured we're heading towards something beautiful and useful. And it might take more than one go to get us there, and that's okay. I'm in my third career, so this is one pot that's been changed a couple of times. And that's all right. As my brother, who's an artist, says, now what would the fun be in it if it was just got right the first time every time? It's better to experiment. He tells the story of a pottery class run by a professor who divides the whole class up into two groups and he says to the first group, all right, you're going to be graded on one pot. You are to make one perfect pot by the end of the semester. That's all I want, just one pot. And you'll be graded on the quality of that pot. And to group two, he says, now you all have to make a thousand pots. But I don't care about the quality of those pots. Just make them one after the other after the other until you've got a thousand pots. Which of those two groups do you think made the perfect pot? Group two. Why? Because they experimented. They had to go over and do it again and again and again. And eventually they learned balance. They learned how to form the vessel. They learned about its shape and what it could stand, the thinness it would take and wouldn't. And eventually they created a wonderful pot, a perfect pot. 
So don't worry about being perfect at the start. None of us are. It takes time. It takes a lot of pressure and love from God to get us there. But rest assured, we're on our way. It's a lesson for us all if we observe trust in God's ways and God's process for us. There'll be a lot of refinement along the way, but that's good for us. And if we stick with God's path and God's plan, we will truly be good in God's eyes. And we'll have joy in our lives because of it. Let's pause for a moment of silence. Please rise.